Open your Bibles tonight to the book of Acts, chapter number 8. Acts, chapter number 8. We're going to begin tonight in verse number 1. Acts, chapter 8, verse number 1. As soon as you find Acts 8, 1, would you stand with me and we'll honor God's word as we read it by standing. Prayer is the key to revival. D.L. Moody once said, all great revivals can be traced to a kneeling figure. Tonight, if you're saved, you can probably trace your salvation to a kneeling figure. Somebody prayed for you. You remember somebody got down and prayed for you to be saved. And we're not going to have revival unless we get down and pray. And so, as I do in all the meetings, as soon as I'm done reading, I invite anyone that would like to to come down to the altar and we'll have prayer together. Now, you might say, I'm not comfortable coming down there. If you're not, that's fine. You can be seated. Or if you're not physically able, I understand. But everybody is encouraged and invited to come and pray with me if you would. Acts chapter 8, verse number 1. And Saul, and of course this is Saul, who will later become the apostle Paul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Now this is a reference to the first deacon in the church. His name was Stephen. And in chapter 7, Stephen had just been stoned to death. Paul did not throw a stone, but as a young man, he held the coats of those that did. And it says, he consented unto the death of Stephen. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Make note of that. The apostles did not leave Jerusalem. The rest were scattered. And devout men carried Stephen (coughs) to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy. In that city. Now drop down in that same chapter to verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. And a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. 
He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. I invite anyone who'd like to come and join me at the altar. We're going to kneel and pray. The remainder you can be seated, but everybody's welcome to pray with me. Dear God, we are glad to be in your house tonight on a Monday night. And I'm so thankful for these that have come out. And I know they've got busy schedules, but tonight they were able to put you first in their life. And I'm thankful for that, Lord. And I'm still praying tonight for a man or a woman that needs revival in the worst way. They've just kind of got comfortable. They've kind of become routine in their religion. But you don't want that. You want them to be spirit-led Christians. You want them to have a hop in their step and a joy in their heart to do your work every day of their life. And dear God, I pray for those lukewarm Christians. I pray for those that are straddling the fence and they need to do something for you. Lord, I pray tonight this message would inspire them. I'm praying that from this message tonight, someone would see a soul saved. And eternity would be changed for someone. Lord, give me the boldness to preach, clarity of thought, presence of mind to be right on track and I'm praying tonight that your Holy Spirit would truly do his office work in hearts tonight. Lord we give you the next few moments. Take them bless them. In Jesus name Amen I was preaching a meeting in Helena, Montana at the Friendship Baptist Church where Brother David Class is the pastor. Brother David is a good Tulsa boy. And I've been with him many times. And while I'm there, Brother David really likes a preacher to uh, take me to some high-class places to eat. You could learn from that. (laughs) One day he said, Brother Kent, 
I've got coupons to eat at Taco John's for lunch. I can learn. Yeah. And I said, that's fine, preacher. Let's use your coupons and let's go eat at Taco John's. And we went to Taco John's and we met another man in the church and we got our dollar tacos and there we sat and ate them. And all of a sudden the preacher, if you know David Class, he's kind of an ADD adult. And it didn't surprise me when he jumped up and ran across the restaurant and just left us. I figure he saw somebody new. Wasn't long, he came back with a man in tow. Across that restaurant, he saw a man wearing an Oklahoma Sooner ball cap. It said OU on it. And David's a big OU fan. And he ran across that room and ran straight up to that guy and said, Hey, are you really an Oklahoma Sooner fan? Or are you just wearing that hat? And the fellow said, no, I'm an Oklahoma Sooner fan. He said, how would you like to meet a man from Chickasha, Oklahoma? And the guy said, well, that'll be fine. So here Brother David brings him over to the table. And he comes to the end of the table. His name was Tom Simpson. He was 49 years old. And boy, Tom come over and they introduced himself to me and we got to talking about football and about hunting and he was a golf course designer and we started talking about golfing and golf courses and, and we were just having the best visit and, and, and the man that came from church had to go back to work so he left and all of a sudden Brother David jumped up and ran off again and left me with this guy. I barely know him, but we're having a great conversation. And then all of a sudden, the thought came to my mind. Have you ever had that thought? I wonder if Tom knows the Lord. I wonder if Tom is a Christian. And so when we had a little break in the conversation, I looked up and I said, Tom, let me ask you something. If you'd die today and walk up to the gates of heaven and God would meet you and say, why should I let you in? What would you say? And he looked at me and he said, well, I guess I'd say I'm a sooner. <laughs> and we both laughed and I said, yeah, that's funny, Tom, but that's not the right answer, is it? And all of a sudden, Tom Simpson re leaned over and grabbed the edge of that table with both hands and leaned right into my face. And I saw his bottom lip begin to quiver. Now when you're out in public like this, and you see a 49-year-old man about to lose his emotions, it's a very disturbing thing. And he looked me right in the eye, and he said, a year ago, someone gave me a book. It was called The Purpose Driven Life. Now, I don't care what you think about Rick Warren and all of that. I'm just telling you what he said. He said, I read all of that book. And I know my life is not what it ought to be. Well, all of a sudden, the preacher came back, and the preacher wanted to talk about football again. And then we got to talking about hunting, and, and we just kept visiting. Tom never left. He just stood there visiting with us. And finally, the preacher got up and said, Well, Tom, we've got to go, but Brother Kent's preaching tonight at 7 o'clock. Why don't you come to the service and hear him preach? And, and he wouldn't leave us. He's walking across the Taco John's with us. And, and I open the glass door, and the preacher comes through, and Tom is right behind him and in my mind and in my heart the Spirit of God is screaming Kent, this man needs to be saved. You need to open your mouth. You need to do something. And right when he stepped into the threshold of that door, I'm holding the door open for him. I look him right in the eye and I said, Tom, you know you need to be saved. Wouldn't you like to get saved right now? And I'm going to tell you, he just burst into tears. He just began to weep uncontrollably. He said, yes, I need to be saved. 
And I said, well, first off, let's get out of this doorway because someone's going to come through this door. <laughs> and we went to beside the building and we stood in the shade and Brother David got on one side and I got on the other and I went through the plan of salvation and Tom prayed the most wonderful prayer and asked Jesus into his heart and was gloriously saved right there beside Taco John's. And we got in the car to leave and the preacher didn't even know what had just happened. And he turned and he looked at me. And I really thought he was going to say something really spiritual. And you know what he said? He said, I'm sure glad he wasn't wearing a Texas Longhorn cap. <laughs> I'd have never even said hi to him. Tonight I want to speak on the subject of opening your mouth. Did you see it in verse number 5? The Bible says, and Philip opened his mouth. I've got to believe that today in 2012 in the churches of America, in our Baptist churches in America, one of the greatest needs, if not the greatest need, is for the Christians to start opening your mouth. Open your mouth and preach Jesus Christ. You see, Philip was not a deacon. I mean, Philip was not an apostle. He was a deacon. If you go to Acts chapter 6, you'll find they chose seven men of honest report. The first one, his name was Stephen. The second one, his name was Philip. You might say that Stephen was the chairman of the deacon board and Philip was his vice chairman. In chapter 7, the Bible says that the chairman of the deacon board just got killed. And if you'll go home and read chapter 7, you'll find the only reason that Stephen got killed was because Stephen would not close his mouth. He stood up and preached a message that made the people so mad that they gnawed on him with their teeth and they covered their ears and they stomped their feet and they took him to the edge of the city and they stoned him to death. Now, I don't know about you, if the chairman of the deacon board just got killed for opening his mouth, this might be a good time for the vice chairman to shut up. You know, I've actually heard preachers before, you know, uh, preach on something and it stirs up something and they're kind of like, well, we might ought to let up on that a little bit. That caused too much trouble. Well, you know, that would have been a good thing for Philip to say. You know what? They just killed Stephen. I think we're going to go underground for a while here. I want you to notice, while they're burying Stephen back in Jerusalem, Philip leaves and goes straight down to Samaria and he starts preaching the gospel right there. Philip was not an apostle. He was just a regular guy. And you find that Philip opened his mouth because first off, he had a great amount of courage. And I'm going to tell you tonight that if you're going to open your mouth and talk to people about Jesus Christ, it takes courage. And let's just get down to brass tacks tonight and start where it's the hardest. Opening your mouth to talk to your own family. I'm going to tell you I'd rather witness to anybody but my own family. They know you. Mm -hmm. They know you warts and all. They've seen you lose your temper at the family reunion and cuss somebody out. It's hard to witness to your own family. It takes courage. I was in town in Oklahoma years ago and my mother called me and she said, Kent, I wanted to call and tell you that your Uncle Lester is having surgery tomorrow at San Anthony Hospital. Lester never went to church, was not a Christian. He spent his whole life down at the country club. He was a country clubber. Sucked on a cigarette and smoked like a chimney his whole life. And sure enough, they found a spot on his lung, cancer. 
Now, you know that you have three lobes of your lung. And so they said, we can get that cancer. We're just going to have to remove one lobe of his lung. And so mom was worried and she said, Kent, do you think there's any way that you could come up and see Uncle Lester? And I remember I said, well, mom, you know, I'm in town for one day and I got a bunch of stuff I got to do and I'm really busy and, I, you know, and you know how your mother can do you. Well, if you can't make it, I understand. You know, that doesn't mean that at all, but that's what they say. And when I heard that, I said, okay, Mom, I'll, I'll be up there. Well, I got up there to St. Anthony's and the room was just jammed with family, everybody laughing and visiting. And yes, my whole family, we're all nuts, just like I am. And I stood in the corner very quietly, and all of a sudden, that hospital room cleared out. It was just amazing. Everybody went out in the hall to talk. <coughs> and I stood in the corner of that hospital room with my Uncle Lester. And I walked up to the side of the bed, and I'm going to tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world. And I said, Uncle Lester... How do you stand with the Lord? And he said, not very good. And I began to go through the Romans road of salvation and tell him how Jesus loved him and how he died for him. And right there in that bed, my Uncle Lester prayed and called upon the name of the Lord and was saved. Amen. And as soon as we said amen, that door opened and here come all the family right back in. <laughs> He went in that day and had surgery, and the surgery went perfect. They removed that lobe of his lung, and it just all went great. And We were all so happy. And then three days after the surgery, a blood clot kicked loose, went straight to the base of his brain, and killed my Uncle Lester just like that. I'm so glad that day that I opened my mouth. I'm so glad I went up there that day and mustered every bit of courage I had in my spiritual life to talk to my own family. My dad's brother Cecil come down with cancer. Dad said, we're going down to Ardmore to see Uncle Cecil. You want to go with us? And I said, yeah, I'll ride down there. Same situation. I stood in the corner of a packed room. All of a sudden, the room cleared out. <laughs> Me and Uncle Cecil in there all alone. I slipped up beside him. I said, Uncle Cecil, how do you stand with the Lord? He had the same answer. Not very good at all. I took him through the plan of salvation. Uncle Cecil prayed and asked Jesus into his heart. And he said, give me those Kleenexes. And he took that box of Kleenexes and he was wiping the tears out of his eye. And all of a sudden the door flew open and in walked my Aunt Frances. She's a big Jehovah Witness. And she sat down on the edge of the bed and she took Cecil's hand and she said, Cecil, honey, I don't think you'll make it into the kingdom. That's what she said. But I want you to know that I loved you even though you're not going to be in the kingdom with me. And Uncle Cecil looked right at her and said, Franny, Kent just told me how to get saved and I just trusted the Lord as my Savior. I'm going to heaven. Amen. And she looked at me. And I was like, nah, 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 nah. It's hard to talk to your family. And there's some of you in this room tonight, you've actually got a mama and a daddy that's on their way to the lake of fire. Some of you have got grandchildren and you've got husbands and wives and sons and daughters. And I wish I could tell you it's easy, but you know what? You're going to have to muster every bit of courage you've got to open your mouth. It was a courageous thing for Philip to go down to the city of Samaria and start preaching while they're burying Stephen. It took courage. And then I want you to notice 
that it brought great joy. You ever notice when you've got a soul winner, there's joy around that person. There's some of you, there's no joy ever around you. It's like dead lice falling off of you. <laughs> well, brother, Ken, bless God, I'm a Christian. <laughs> you know what? There is no joy around a Christian that doesn't win a soul. And I don't want to be ugly and I don't want to be mean, but there's some of you members right here at Thomas Road Baptist Church, you've never ever won anybody to Jesus Christ, and there is no joy around you. But when you are a soul winner, those are fun people to be around. Those are people where there's joy around them because they're changing lives and they're changing eternities. You see, Philip was a man that had courage and he was a man that brought joy where he went. Why? Because he was a soul winner. I want you to notice too that it took a great amount of obedience. Do you see the two acts of obedience? Look at verse 26. I see the first act of obedience. Do you see it there? And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip and said, Arise, and go toward the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And the Bible says, And he began to hold prayer meetings and pray and see if it would be God's will for him to go down to Gaza. What version are you reading? I'm reading the dead Baptist church member version. And he arose and he went. Drop down to verse number 30. 29, don't have to go, we'll get to 30. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. What did Philip do? And Philip ran thither to him. You see, twice the Spirit of God spoke to Philip, and both times he never even hesitated. He obeyed the Spirit of God. When I went to Baptist Bible College years ago, one of my professors was old Dr. R.O. Woodworth. And when you go to Baptist Bible College, you have to take P.E. Now, that's not physical education. It's personal evangelism. And Dr. Woodworth taught personal evangelism. And I'll never forget, and Brother Woodworth said this one day. It's a very simple phrase, but I never have ever forgotten it. Dr. Woodworth said, the person that you feel like you should talk to is exactly who God wants you to talk to. Have you ever been sitting in the dentist's office waiting for your appointment and you're having a nice visit with somebody and all of a sudden the thought comes to your mind, I wonder if this person knows Jesus. You know who that is? That's the Spirit of God trying to get you to open your mouth. Some of you go and have dinner with your family. And while you're having dinner, you're thinking, this family member's not saved. You know who that is? It's the Spirit of God trying to get you to open your mouth. You know what, folks? Philip was used of God because he was obedient to the Spirit of God. And there's some of you tonight, and I, I want to stop and park here a minute because there's some of you that are real good people and you're real faithful to Thomas Road Baptist Church, but you're far from an obedient Christian. There's some of you tonight that have different levels of disobedience. And let's just go ahead and get number one out of the way because it's the one no one ever wants to talk about in church. It's the one everyone hates. Some of you are disobedient and you're giving to God. You see, the Bible says very clearly that if you're a born-again child of God, you ought to pay your tithes. Did you notice I didn't say give your tithe? I said pay your tithe. You know why? One-tenth of your gross earnings belongs to God. Did you hear me? Now, if you're not a Christian tonight and you're not a regular to church, don't let that blow you away. You'll have to learn that later after you get saved. I'm talking to the Christians in this building. You Christians and members of this church, you need to be putting 10% of your gross earnings in the offering plate every time you get paid. 
Now, I didn't say net, I said gross. Some people say, well, I don't know the difference between gross and net. <laughs> well, let me help you with that tonight. <laughs> when you get your paycheck, you look right up in the corner, and the top corner will tell you exactly what you earned. We all know Uncle Sam's going to take out Social Security, taxes. State Arizona is going to take something out. Some of you have something deducted to your credit union to pay your dental insurance or your car payment, and then the rest of it is added up and put in the form of a check. You do not give 10% of that check. That's not your gross earnings. That's your net earnings. That's what's left over. You give 10% of that top figure. That's what you actually earned. Well, Brother Ken, I never see that money. Well, the day you agreed to become a citizen of the United States of America, you agreed to pay their taxes. And if you don't like that, then move to Lawrence Oblovia where they have no taxes. <laughs> I like America. Amen. And I don't like taxes, but I don't like the alternative. You do not give 10% of what's left over. You give 10% of the net, of the gross. The top figure is what you give. Some people say, Brother Ken, I don't know how to figure 10%. Well, you're not a mathematician, but I'll help you with that tonight. <laughs> Whatever that gross figure is, just move the decimal one number to the left. It works on any figure. It doesn't matter what the figure is. Move the decimal one number to the left, and you will have your tithe. You make $325, move it one decimal to the left, and your tithe is $3,250. It's that easy. You should be able to do it. But you know what? Some of you are disobedient to God. Well, we're really praying about whether we ought to start tithing. <laughs> Philip didn't pray at all. He did what God told him to do. And tithing is one of those things that are thus saith the Lord God. There is no praying, no prayer needed. Just do it. There's some of you tonight that have been saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized. Well, Brother Kent, uh, I got saved when I was 32, but I really got baptized when I was six years old. And I really don't want to get baptized again. You're a disobedient Christian. Because you don't get baptized before you get saved. You get baptized after you get saved. And I don't care whether you were sprinkled or christened or dunked or poured. It doesn't matter. It happens after you get saved. And if we want to talk about scriptural baptism, let's use this very text. The Bible doesn't say that Philip said, there's a bowl of water, can I be baptized? No, it says there was a deep water there. Because the Bible says Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water together. You know what that teaches? Deep water baptism. And there's some of you tonight, you're a disobedient child of God because you will not be scripturally baptized. Someone says, well, I'm scared of water. Get over it. <laughs> I'm sorry. You need to be obedient to God. You're a disobedient Christian when you don't do the things that God tells you to do. We're supposed to study our Bibles. You're supposed to read it every day and not only read it but study it. You don't have to pray about that. You just got to do it. The Bible says forsake not the assembly of the church together. You don't have to pray about going to church. You just do it. You go to church. These are things of obedience. You see Philip was able to be used of God because number one Philip was courageous. Number two he was obedient. I love it too that Philip knew his Bible. You see in verse number 30 there, when he ran to that eunuch, he's reading Isaiah and he starts asking questions and Philip knew exactly how to answer his questions because he knew the Bible. I think it's horrible that a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon can pin most of you in a minute or two on your front porch. It's horrible. Someone told me the other day, well, Brother Ken, I had a Jehovah Witness come by and knock on my door and I walked out on that porch and I said, get off my property right now and don't you ever come back. Was that good, Brother Ken? 
I said, well, that's not exactly what I do around my house. In fact, when they come up on the porch, I'm like, well, hello. <laughs> Y'all want to talk about the Bible? Come on in. Let's sit down. I'll go get my Bible. And I guarantee in about 20 minutes, they're like, we can see you're not interested. <laughs> and we really need to be going. And I'm like, no, no, you're not going anywhere. We're talking about the Bible. Well, when I nailed one the other day, I took him over to Isaiah and Bible, the Christmas verse where it says, you know, that Jesus will be born and we'll call him Counselor and the Mighty God. And I go, who is this a reference to? He said, well, that's a reference to Jesus. I said, ooh, wait a minute. It says Jesus is a mighty God. I thought Jehovah was the only God. Well, uh, well, uh, I said, right now you got two gods. And then he said, well, the devil's a God too. Well, that didn't take long to dismantle that. But he was begging to get off my porch. You know what, Christian? You ought to know your Bible good enough that you could defend the faith with a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon. And you know what's really sad? Some of you have been in church for years. You know, and preachers, it gets discouraging, doesn't you, that you preach to these people all these years and some of them are still dumber than a stump. You know why? Because you, you really haven't made a commitment to learn the Bible. Get some ammunition. Philip knew the Word of God. And then I want you to notice, Philip knew Jesus. What did he preach to him? He preached Jesus. You know, every time you start to witness someone about Jesus, I notice that they try to run you down a rabbit trail. Do you ever get into that? They want to they wanna run. Well, what do you think about speaking in tongues? Well, I don't even think about that. I'm thinking about Jesus. Well, what do you think about barriers? Well, I don't like them when I'm trying to run from yard to yard. I fall over them. <laughs> I was on in the studio audience of Jeopardy one day with Alex Trebek. And they told us that Alex likes to take questions, but you can't ask him a personal question. Well, about the third show in, I just couldn't resist it. I put my hand up. Alex said, yes, sir, can I help? What's your question? I said, Alex, I notice you ask a lot of questions on Jeopardy about the Bible. You even say things from the Bible at times. I've heard you quote the Bible. Alex, are you a student of the Bible? Are you a believer? And whoo, it sucked all the oxygen out of that studio just like that. <laughs> all the cameramen turned around going, who's this idiot? <laughs> all the panel of judges looking at me. Alex didn't say a word. He just looked at me. He began to rub his mustache. He climbed up into his little Alex Trebek director chair. And he said, I think religion. He said, I was raised a Catholic in Canada. And I know a lot of born again people, but I wouldn't call myself born again. He said, in fact, I think religion will lead a lot of people to hell. And I said, Alex, you're exactly right. I believe, too, that religion leads a lot of people to hell. But you know what's really important, Alex, is the question that Larry King was asked on his TV show one night. Now, I don't know where I came up with that. I'm trying to relate to a TV person. And it, God brought it to me. And boy, Alex sat up on his little chair and he goes, well, what was Larry King asked? And I said, one night on the Larry King show, he was asked this. If you could interview God and ask him one question. What would you ask God? Boy, Alex was very interested. It might actually be a question on Jeopardy someday. <laughs> he said, what did Larry King say? I said, when Larry King was asked if I could interview God and only ask one question, Larry King said this. I would ask him, do you have a son? And if you do, was his name Jesus? 
I said, Alex, that's really the most important question. Do you know Jesus Christ? And I don't have time to tell the whole story, but what was to be a question and answer to the audience turned into two hours of a rolling debate between me and Alex in between every taping of that show until finally the crowd turned on Alex and started going, Yeah, Alex, I agree with that guy. <laughs> we argued evolution, carbon 12 day, you know, we, we did it all. And uh, finally, the last scene, Alex said, Well, I'm glad we live in a country where if I don't agree with you, you're not going to pull a gun out and kill me. And if you don't agree with me, you're not going to quit watching my show. And I said, Alex, oh, I'm not going to quit watching your show. We love you. But I said, I do have an 80-year-old mother at home, and she watches you every day of her life. And she's going to be really disappointed in you. And I tell her about this conversation. And he busted out laughing, and so did the audience. And that was the end of it. One week later, after another revival, I went to the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> no pun intended, but I was on a roll. <laughs> now, they don't take questions, but the same people that run Jeopardy run the Wheel of Fortune. It's all run by a company called King World. Same cameramen, same security guards, same everything except the stars. And all of a sudden, a security guard stepped down beside me, and he looked at me, and I'm like. <laughs> and he goes, you're that Baptist preacher from last week at Jeopardy, aren't you? <laughs> I said, uh, he, yeah. <laughs> he squatted down. He goes, that was so cool. <laughs> He goes, I got this job at church. You see that guy over there? We go to the same church. He goes, do you know that we have a Bible study and prayer meeting every morning on the set of Jeopardy and the Wheel of Fortune? And he said no one had the courage to ever ask Alex if he was a Christian. And the next morning we walked into that prayer meeting and everybody was going, yeah! That preacher pinned Alex in there. And now we know Alex is lost and we're praying he gets saved. You know what, folks? Open your mouth. Yes, you feel like an idiot. Yes, it scares you to death. But learn to open your mouth and have courage and have spontaneity. You see, people are not going to come to you and ask. Dr. Aldridge president of the Malothian Bible College in Portland several years ago wrote a book. Did you hear about it? I, I hope this brother Larry doesn't have it on his table. It was called Lifestyle Evangelism. You remember that book? That book just said, don't witness to anybody, just live a good life. And when you live a good life in front of people... They'll want to become a Christian. One year after Dr. Aldridge wrote that book, he got in the pulpit of a church and said, I don't do this anymore because it doesn't work. Folks, it doesn't work. And I'm not against you living a good life. You ought to live a good life. But we need to go one step further and we need to open our mouth. You see, Philip opened his mouth, and what happened? One man got saved. Amen. From everything I've studied, it's the first black man that ever got saved. The first man from the African continent was saved. Isn't that amazing? Philip opened his mouth, and he opened up the whole African continent to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you tonight, when you open your mouth, you never know how far the gospel is going to go. If you've been to Africa today, you know that the gospel is spread all over that continent. And where did it start? It started with one man opening his mouth. You'll never know how far it will go. My daddy was a CB in World War II in the Philippines, New Guinea. After World War II, he came back to Crossville, Illinois, where my mother lived. They were in love, and they were going to get married in two weeks. 
My dad needed a job for two weeks and he went out and started knocking doors looking for a job and he found a company that would hire him. It was called the Superior Oil Company. At that time, the Superior Oil Company was the world's largest independent driller of oil in the world. Today, they're part of the Mobile Exxon Group. He took a two-week job and it turned into a 17-year career. During that career, he was transferred to the little town of Chickasha, Oklahoma. My dad was not a Christian. He was a cigarette-smoking, drinking, cussing, rough, oil well type person. But my mother was saved. My dad would not go to church with her and would not take her to church. You know what my mother did? She got up every Sunday morning, bade my brother and sister, and they walked six or seven blocks to the Calvary Baptist Church in Chickasha. Now I hear women today go, Well, I would come, but my husband will not come with me. And I'm so glad my mother wasn't like that. Amen. If he didn't want to go, that's fine. We're getting up and we're going. Now, he would not let her stay for church. She could only go to Sunday school because my dad was a big family man and his only day off was Sunday. And he said, you come back after Sunday school and we're going to go for a picnic or go fishing or go on a drive. And mom said every Sunday he did something with his kids. So she could only go to Sunday school. You know what she did? She went to Sunday school. Because she went to Sunday school, it gave that pastor up there at Calvary Baptist an excuse to come down and visit my dad at our house. The pastor was a borderline lunatic. His name was J. Curtis Goldman. Curtis Goldman came to mom and dad's house every Thursday night for six months. My dad would laugh at him and blow smoke in his face. Curtis came back the next Thursday night. It came mission conference time. Old Dr. Frank Hoagie from the Philippines was the conference speaker at Calvary. They were out making visits that day and it was lunchtime. If you've ever been to Chickasha, the streets are cut north, south, east, west. Everything's in blocks, very simple town. Brother Goldman takes a turn. He looks over at Frank Hoagie and he says, Brother Hoagie, I know this town as well as I know the back of my hand, but I've just taken the wrong turn. We're going to have to go up and around the block. Catherine had dinner on the table waiting for him. That wrong turn that day went right in front of my parents' house. My dad was standing in the front yard. And of course, back then, they didn't have air conditioning in the cars. The windows were down and Curtis Goldman, being the nut that he was, he yelled out the window, Hey, Jack York, what are you doing? And when my dad saw him, he waved like this. Brother Goldman looked over at Frank Hoagie, the missionary, and said, This guy never wants to talk to me, but he's waving me in. I better pull in. And he got out of the car and he said, Jack, what do you want? And my dad said, Well, my mother-in-law's here. And she's a big Baptist. And I knew you'd want to meet her. So they went into the living room of this little house. It's still there in Chickasha, a little frame house, probably 650 square feet, just a little two-bedroom frame house. Grandma and Mom came out of the kitchen. The table was already set, and the ice was in the glasses, and the ice was melting. It was a warm day. The five of them stood in a circle in the living room of that little house. My dad said, Nanny, here's this Baptist preacher. I knew you'd want to meet him because you're a big Baptist. My grandma wringing her hands in her apron like she always did. said, Brother Goldman, thank you for witnessing to my son-in-law. And I sure wish you'd keep it up. And Brother Goldman, being the nut he was, said, Well, be honest, ma'am, I've given up on him. And my dad said, Well, don't give up on me. And Brother Goldman said, Every time I come over here, you laugh, make fun of me, blow smoke on my face. You know, Jack, I've given up on you. Well, don't give up on me. Well, I have. I've given up. Well, don't give up on me. (laughs) 
And Curtis said, well, Jack, I won't give up on you. In fact, right now you know you need to be saved. Would you trust the Lord right now? My mother said, you could have cut the tension in that room with a knife. It got so quiet. And all of a sudden, my daddy fell straight on his knees, fell straight onto his knees, and climbed across that room and grabbed Brother Goldman's hands and said, yes, I need to be saved. Amen. And Curtis got down on the floor with him and led him to Christ. Amen. When he got up, he said, what do I do next? Brother Goldman said, Come to church and tell everybody you got saved. And he did. He said, what do I do next? He said, bring a change of clothes tonight and we're going to baptize you. And he did. He said, what do I do next? He said, you go to work tomorrow and witness to the people you work with. Monday night, Catherine and Curtis sat down to have dinner. Doorbell rang and there was my dad at the front door. Grab your Bible, preacher. I need you to come talk to these guys. I've been talking at work. Brother Goldman grabbed his Bible and jumped in the front seat. And my dad pulled his pal mails out and put one in his mouth. And Brother Goldman said, pull over and just let me out. And he said, why? He goes, I'm not going if you're going to smoke. And boy, dad put them cigarettes away. And they went out that night and won six adults to the Lord. Amen. The next night he was at the front door again. And every night except Sunday and Wednesday night, Jack York and Curtis Goldman led souls to the Lord. Brother Goldman will tell you it was the most fruitful time in his whole ministry. Well, Superior Oil Company decided to transfer my dad to the little town of Whitesboro, Texas. Back in those days when you got transferred, you just went to the preacher and said, where do I go to church when I get there? My dad did that. Brother Goldman said, you go to Central Baptist Church. There's a really good man there that's the pastor. His name is Ted Hicks. The only problem is, Ted was a drunkard. And one night on the Red River Bridge, he flipped his car over and it pinned him. And the radiator water and the battery acid poured across his face. And he's the most horrible looking thing you'll ever see. His ears were burned off. He's a great man of God, but he, he's, he looks like a monster. Mom and dad moved to Whitesboro. They went to Central Baptist, walked down the aisle Sunday morning, and joined the church. As he went to the back door, he said, Brother Hicks, what night do you have visitation? And Brother Hicks was ashamed to tell him that they don't have visitation. In fact, there was families in the church that had risen up against Brother Hicks and told him he had no business being the pastor. The way he looked, he was scaring people off. He was so depressed, he was not even going into the community. He was going home and going to church, going home and going to church. He had not been out in the community in over six months. Brother Ted Hicks will tell you, that he was even contemplating suicide. He was at the lowest point in his life. Monday night, Brother Hicks said his doorbell rang and he said, Kent, your dad was standing there. He said, Brother Hicks, I know you said you didn't have visitation, but if you got some prospect cards, give them to me and I'll go visit your prospects. Brother Hicks was ashamed to tell my dad he didn't have one prospect. He'd not been out in over six months. He said, your dad took a couple of steps and turned around on that porch and looked at me and said, preacher, grab your coat. We'll go knock some doors and we'll get some prospects tonight. 
And they went out that night and started leading people to the Lord. And every night they went out and a great revival broke out at Central Baptist Church. And that church began to grow. And it wasn't long. Brother Hicks was trans uh, took a church in Santa Ana, California and had a great pastor out there. And while he was out there, he founded the Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College, which today is the Heartland Baptist Bible College in Oklahoma City. And I don't care what you think about it one way or the other. I want you to know that souls are still being won to Christ and preacher boys are still being trained. And because my dad got saved, guess what? I got saved. And I've got four sons, and all four of my sons are saved. And God's called all four of my sons into the ministry. And all four of them have graduated from Baptist Bible College. And all four of them are serving God today and winning souls every day. And Caleb brought my first grandson to me and said, Dad, here's your first grandson. Guess what we named him? He said, we named him Jack York after Grandpa. Now, I don't know if Jack's going to be a preacher. I hope he is. But I know this. Jack York's going to hear about Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know where that all started? <laughs> that started with someone that wouldn't keep their mouth shut. And I am so glad there was a crazy preacher named Curtis Goldman that came every night to my dad's house for six months and opened his mouth. Church, the message tonight is so simple. Go open your mouth. Open your mouth down at the grocery store. Open your mouth out at the restaurant. Open your mouth at the gas station. Open your mouth at the school. Open your mouth at the coffee shop. Open your mouth with your family. You see, we are not given the orders to, to save people. We have been given the orders to tell them about Jesus. And God will have to give the increase. But I'm going to tell you, you ought to be ashamed if you're not opening your mouth every day of your life and talking to someone about Jesus. Open your mouth. Let's stand tonight. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads if you would. We're just going to be a minute or so longer. We need to open our mouths, folks. We need to be soul winners. We need to be spreaders of the gospel. Maybe tonight you'd say, Brother Ken, I am a Christian. But I've not been opening my mouth like I ought to. I know that. And the message tonight, it dealt with my heart. And Brother Ken, I wish you'd pray for me. How many Christians are like that tonight? Would say, Brother Ken, pray for me tonight. Hold your hand up high. Where are you at? Yes. Yes. I've not been opening my mouth like I ought to. Pray for me. Yes. Hands all over. Thank you. Put them down. Maybe tonight you've never been saved. I know tonight this was a message for Christians because that's what revivals are for. But I think tonight you've heard enough to know that if you're not saved, you need to come and trust Christ just like my daddy did. Just like Tom Simpson did at the Taco John's. Just like both my uncles. Just like that Ethiopian eunuch. You need to come and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And in just a moment, if you would come, we'd have someone pray with you. We don't embarrass you. We don't force you. But we could help you tonight trust Jesus. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we give you this invitation tonight. My prayer is that some Christians would leave this building tonight and be committed to go and open their mouth and tell someone about Jesus. Lord, if there's one here tonight that needs to be saved, I pray they'd come. And I know you'd save them. For these that lifted their hand, I'm praying tonight they'd throw down all their pride, all their excuses, and down here at this altar tonight, recommit themselves to be bold, to be unashamed, to be spontaneous and courageous and open their mouth for Jesus. Dear God, you take this invitation. You bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look up here and listen to me just a minute. Every one of you Christians that God's dealing with your heart tonight, I'm going to challenge you to slip to the aisle and come to this altar tonight and say, Dear God, I want to leave and go open my mouth. I want to go open my mouth tomorrow or tonight. I want to be bold for you. If you need to be saved, the pastor, we've got men down here at the altar. You just walk to one of them and say, I want to get saved. They'll help you. Some of you need to come tonight and really just get on your face and say, Dear God, I'm sorry because I have not been opening my mouth and leave here tonight to go and tell. Is God dealing with you tonight? Just like Philip, if he's speaking to you, be obedient. Find your way to this altar tonight. Brother Joel, sing it out for me. Come on right now if you need to come. Come on right now. She's speaking to you, then be obedient. Is he telling you? Go to that altar and commit yourself to open your mouth. Then be obedient to it. Maybe you need to be baptized. Come and say, I want to get baptized. I want to be obedient to the Lord. The sea, I want to open my mouth. There's room Amen. At the How about you? For you? How about you, lukewarm Christian? There's room oh, I'm too shy. I'm too scared. No excuse. You. We're all supposed to open our mouth. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. One more verse, Brother Joel, one more, and this is...